Well, good morning once again, and we just want to welcome you to Encounter Community Church. We are so thankful that you have decided to join us this morning. Now, if you've been with us throughout any time throughout this summer, you know that we are in a sermon series titled Practical Faith. All we're doing is going through the book of James the entire summer, and last week, Jim ended James chapter 3. So this week, we're going to be in James chapter 4, and I think towards the end of his sermon last week, Jim said something very profound. He said, the only activity worth anything is when God is involved. The only activity worth anything is when God is involved, because we know when God's involved, great things happen. And so as we had turned our attention to James chapter 4, we're going to see why this is so true. So ever since sin entered the Garden of Eden, war has been declared. This war affects you, and it affects me. It affects your decision-making, your job, your relationships. It affects everything about you. We think that this world revolves around us. Amen? But it doesn't in reality. Because this world could care less about you. It could care less about you. Because it's not about you, yet the problem is, we think it is. And the war is this right here. The war is between self and God. Self and God. Always a struggle. Always a fight. God wants you. Yet, you don't naturally want God because we're all about self. It's all about me, what I want, what my, I desire. Yet James tells us this in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. He says this right here. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Now, if you notice here, there are 12 you statements within these first three verses. If the word passions there in verse 1 is translated in the Greek as desires or pleasures, so what James is telling us is he's saying our desires are at war within us. James is speaking to an audience of believers who are quarreling and fighting and bickering amongst themselves when they should be spreading the love of God, when they should be loving others. Yet, don't we see that in the church today? Sad to say, but it's in every church. Why? Because we want what we want and not what somebody else wants. I'm looking after me and not you. But James is saying, if you're doing that, why? Why are you doing this? These believers were fighting amongst themselves because each person was looking after them and not their brother and sister in Christ. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 5, 24, when he says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and self. It's an impossibility. Wearsby says this, living for the flesh means grieving the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us. When we live for self and not for God, we grieve the Holy Spirit because we're putting our desires, our wants, our needs, our hopes, our dreams above God's plan. What we want above God's plan. We stop the Spirit's progress in us by giving over to self and not to God. Why do we do this? Because we naturally gravitate towards our flesh, towards our desires, and we will protect self at all costs, no matter what, no matter who it hurts. And all the time it does hurt. Maybe not you, but someone around you. This reminds me of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Ironically. 
Uh, wasn't really a fan of the movies. They were okay. They were too long for my taste, but whatever. Um, there's three of them, I think. And uh, I'm pretty sure I slept through about the first one, and I had to wake up. And, oh, yeah, I remember that. But there was a character named Gollum. And if you're familiar with the movie at all, Gollum was a man who was obsessed with the one ring who could rule all rings. Throughout the movie, is this ring changes everything about Gollum. It changes his desires, his physical body, his mind. He's constantly trying to serve the ring, but also pleases Master Frodo. There's this internal struggle to please both the ring and his master. He's being bent in his mind to the desires of the ring, saying, I really want to serve this ring. This looks awesome. There's so much power behind it. But, man, I also want to don't disappoint my master. But I really want this ring. It's awesome. It's going to give me the power to rule everything. I'll have everything I ever wanted. But I also don't want to disappoint my master. See, I can identify with Gollum. As weird of a creature he is, if you look him up on Google, he looks really weird. But as weird as he is, I can relate to him. Because how often are you and I guilty of bending towards our own self-interest Instead of the interest of God, doing what I want, what I think's best, versus what God wants. James has a word for when we bend towards self-interest instead of God. He says this in verse 4. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. We are guilty of adultery when this happens. We're guilty of adultery. You're guilty of adultery. I'm guilty of adultery. And David Platt says this, the more we are conformed to the pattern of this world, living like this world, and loving this world, the more we betray God and cheat on him. Romans 12, 2 tells us this. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Paul is speaking to us Christians, us believers, that we are to look differently than the world around us. It's about being transformed in our mind, not conforming to the world, not becoming like the world, but becoming different than the world. The biggest lie Satan has sold the church is to think that you can be a friend of God and a friend of the world. Thinking we can be a friend of God and a friend of the world leads us to this question right here. How can you, Christian, say you're a child of God and be in bed with the world? But we must remember what James tells us in verse 4. That if we are a friend of the world, what we really are is an enemy of God. There is a war going on between us, a constant battle, a constant struggle between what I want and what God wants for me. The prophet Jeremiah says that our souls are desperately wicked. That God searches our souls. He searches our minds to the core of who we are. He knows what we really need. And that's a heart transplant. But we serve a jealous God, amen? We serve a jealous God, and James tells us this in verse 5. Or do you suppose that it's to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealousy over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Now James is talking about the jealousy God has over our human spirit, our souls. In Exodus 20, verse 5, as Moses was writing the Ten Commandments that God was telling him, God is speaking and he says, I, the Lord, am a jealous God. But why is God so jealous? He's jealous because he loves you. And he's jealous because he loves me. God loves his creation so much that he sent Christ's son, his son, to die on the cross for you and I. 
Christ paid the penalty for our sins by dying the death that I deserve, that you deserve, and by raising the life three days later at the resurrection. Romans 5.8 tells us that we can have a relationship with the Father because of God's love and because of his son Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. We can only have this relationship with the Father if we do what James tells us in verse 7. He says this right here. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. See, in order for us to have a relationship with God, we must submit to God. In order for us to have a relationship with God, we must submit to God. Submission to God is not an option for the truly repentant believer. You don't have a choice. Now, some of you guys like definitions, like I know Ken Job does. He's a definition man. And he, I looked it up, and submit means this, to give over or yield to the power or authority of another. To give over or yield to the power or authority of another. See, some people say that the president of the United States is the most powerful man in the world. I say this is a lie. Because the most powerful man in the world is not from this world. But he's the creator of the world. It's God Almighty. Who has the greatest power and authority? It's God himself. God is giving us the answer to how we can defeat the enemy that is self. The internal struggle that we have. Number one, we have to submit to God. It starts there. But he doesn't end there. He says this, continuing in verse 7. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. The devil will do anything he can to prevent you from submitting to God. The devil will do anything he can to put as much distance between you and God. Why? Because 1 Peter 5 eight says this. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour See, Satan is always on alert, seeking someone to destroy. He is the great adversary of God because he hates God. He wants to see as many people fail in their relationship with God, and he will do whatever he can to make that happen, to destroy that relationship. The devil does not care about you. The devil does not care about me. We're a pawn to him to get to God, as James, as Jim said last week. He wants to use you to get to God. Don't be a pawn in his game. That's what he's telling us. Don't be a pawn in his game. But in order for us to resist the devil, we have to do what James says in verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The third way to win this war against ourself versus the desires of God is to draw near to God. A.W. Tozer says this, The more we are like God, the nearer we are to God. The more we are like God, the nearer we are to God. You see, it's impossible to draw near to God when we are living in habitual, unrepentant sin. It's an impossibility. You can't do it. Trust me, I've tried. It doesn't work. It does not work because James goes on to say in verse 8, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. See, what he's saying there is he's saying that you, we not, we're not to be double-minded or wavering in sin. We have to choose God over self. If you think you've gone too far from God, you've gone astray from God, there is good news. Look at what Christ says in Luke 15, 20 through 24. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And ran and embraced him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, 
I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And they began to celebrate. Are you lost in need of being found? Turn to God. Are you dead in your sin? Turn to God. Look what Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, when he says this. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You see, when we were enemies of God, he still made a way for you and I to have a restored relationship with the Father through the death of his Son on the cross. And that's why James tells us this in verses 9 through 10. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And he will exalt you. You want to win the war over self? James tells us to weep over our sins. To humble ourselves before the holy and mighty God. Almighty. We need to mourn over our sins. Confess them. Humble ourselves before our creator. You want to win the war? James tells us to do these things. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Draw near to God. Mourn over our sin. Humble yourself before God. Now you may think to yourself, how can I possibly win this war? If there's nothing good inside me, if all I'm doing every single day is struggling just to get by, struggling to not sin, struggling to get along with my coworkers, struggling to get along with my parents, struggling to get along with my family, struggling to get along with even a stranger, how hard that is, amen? How can I possibly win the war? How can I submit to God, resist the devil? How am I supposed to draw near to God? There's great news this morning. You can't. You can't win the war. You can't win the war on your own. It is impossible to win this war on your own. You will fail. I will fail. I have failed. Even this week, I failed in my struggle to draw near to God. This week brought allergies upon me, which I had to fight all week. I had schoolwork going on. I had to write a paper. I have relationships I got to keep up with. I had to be at work just like everybody else. And just when I thought I had time to draw near to God, it seemed like it was taken away. It seemed like it was taken away. The week where I thought, oh, great, I know I'm preaching on the 25th. I knew this for about two months. I'm good to go. I'm prepared. I'm ready. Life happens. It happens. I'm not going to sit up here and say I'm perfect. I'm not. I'm not a liar. I'm not perfect. You aren't either. But I know this. God is faithful by his immeasurable grace. And in verse 6, James tells us this. But he gives more grace. Amen. But he gives more grace. God's grace cannot be measured. It can't be bought. It can't be weighed. And it can't be fully comprehended. I've tried to comprehend grace. I've tried to wrap my mind 
around this idea, this term grace. What is it? What did I do to deserve it? How do I extend it? But I thank God for it every single day when I fall short. Because I will fall short. You will fall short. But thank God for Romans 3.23. Because we, we know this. All have fallen short of the glory of God, yet he still loves us. He loves you in spite of you. Try to find someone in this world who's going to love you for you, for who you really are. It's hard to do. Very hard to do. But we know this, that when we fall short, God gives us more grace. When we fall short, God gives us more grace. This is a grace that is uncomprehendable, unstoppable, but it's completely reliable. James goes on to say this in verse 6 as he finishes up. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You see, in God's infinite wisdom, he gives us grace to keep pursuing, to keep persisting, to keep persevering, to keep fighting, and winning the war over self. Only through God's grace alone can this be done. Because we just talked about how Jeremiah says the heart is desperately wicked. We just talked about the internal struggle we have every single day when it's my desire and what I want to do versus what God is calling me to do. We just talked about how when you grieve the Holy Spirit that is in you as a believer, what that does is it's saying, I don't care what God wants, I'm on the throne. But it must not be this way. You can't have it. If you're trying to win the war over the self, self has to disappear at some point. Amen? Thankfully, we have God's grace to hold us up when we fall, when we fail, because we will, as I have. But you may feel like the world's biggest failure. I feel like that sometimes. Anybody else? You may feel like the biggest hypocrite saying you love Christ, but you got mad at your kid. You may feel like you're the biggest disappointment. Look to his grace. You may feel like you're too far gone from God. We just talked about the prodigal son, amen? Draw near to him. It's only by the grace of God every single day that we have the opportunity to draw away from ourselves and draw near to God. To stop living for ourselves and living for him. If we submit, resist the devil, and draw near, we will be victorious in winning the war over self. Is it easy? No. Because we're still in the flesh. As Jim says all the time at the fountain, we still live in the flesh. Even though we want what God wants, even though our hearts, as you become a Christian, your heart gravitates towards those things of God, as you ingrate yourself in the word, as you ingrate your, yourself in black-minded believers, you want to this to be true for your life, but sometimes it's just not. I mean, let's be real. It's just not. Even though I want it to be, every day I'm like, okay, I have another day. Thank God. Woo, I made it to 30. All right. Even though I wanted this to be true for me, there's things I have to do. It doesn't just happen. I just want things to happen sometimes they don't. I actually have to try. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. But we know this, we can win the war over self only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God. And if we submit, resist the devil, and draw near, we will be victorious in winning the war. But the question becomes this right here, who is winning the war? Who's winning the war? Is it self or is it God? Is it self or is it God? Who is winning the war? Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you will give us the courage, the persistence, the ability to fight self and win the war over self. To win the war of our hearts being geared towards you. 
Lord, as we draw near, as we submit, as we resist the devil, you will be made known in our life. God, let us be bold in our prayers that we want to do your will and not our will. We want to live for you and not for self. We want you above all else and nothing that this world offers. God, just be with us in this moment. Help us resist the devil. Help us submit to you. Not our will, but your will be done, Lord. Let us leave this place a changed man, a changed woman, a changed person for your glory. Amen. We're getting ready to enter into a time of response. This altar is wide open. Feel free to pray. If you need to submit to God right here, pray right here. I'll be over here to my left, your right.